o'clock. Final answer, it is five o'clock, so I'll call this meeting to order. Uh, running through the roll call, Alder Feldy? Here. Ackley? Here. Lucky Paneski? Here. Perella? Here. Uh, Mitchell's here, that makes five. We have a quorum. Will you all please stand and join me in the pledge? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, and barring any objections, we'll jump over introductions, unless... All right, and move on to item number five, which is the approval of minutes from our March 14th meeting. Is there any discussion on the prior meeting's minutes? If not, we'll be looking for a motion to approve. So moved. Okay. All right, we have a motion and a second, then seeing no further discussion, all in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Chair votes aye, the ayes have it, the motion passes. Next up is item number six, which is resolution number 168 of 2122, a resolution authorizing the addition of a neighborhood engagement specialist to the City of Sheboygan Table of Organization. Thank you, Chair. So the item before you is about adding a position to the City of Sheboygan's Table of Organization in the Department of City uh, Development, and the position would be a Neighborhood Engagement Specialist. Um, just to give you a little bit of background, when the City, uh, through the Community Policing stat Strategy that Chief Domagowski brought here in 2010, um, we had worked with a group called Sheboygan Neighborhood Pride to establish neighborhood associations across the city. Since 2010, 12 neighborhood associations have been established. Um, of the 72 that are identified as police districts and that could be uh, neighborhood associations, 17% um, of the neighborhoods have established associations. In doing some research with our adjoining um, municipalities around the state, Oshkosh and Green Bay, for example, are creating between five and seven new neighborhood associations a year. Um, they're telling us that uh, if you have interested people that you should be able to facilitate an association creation within um, five to seven, maybe a year, but really five to seven months. Um, so what we're hoping to do with this position is uh, allow this person to be a full-time person dedicated to working with our partners in the community of establishing more neighborhood associations. I think Sheboygan Neighborhood Pride has proven to be a good partner. They've struggled with recruiting board members, so there's really only one, maybe two people that are out there working with neighborhoods, and what we're hearing from neighborhoods that are, cre are being created is that it's taking anywhere from one year to as much as three years to create a neighborhood association, and you're losing momentum by the time you get, to that pro get through that process. And I think, you know, as we know, it's hard to get people interested in um, working together and, and creating an association and taking on some leadership roles within their neighborhood. Um, and then when the process is lagging uh, in trying to employ um, and get people and bylaws and all that stuff, you lose a lot of momentum as in that process. So what we're hoping to do with this uh, position is it would be funded with um, the uh, community development block grant dollars that we receive and affordable housing fund uh, dollars. There would be no funding out of the general fund. Uh, it would just be strictly those two uh, funding sources that would fund this position. Um, the person would be, the position would be responsible for uh, really trying to generate interest in the neighborhoods, working with the police officers, with the neighborhood officers and the beat officers um, and being really kind of the boots on the ground of going to meetings, identifying people, going to community gatherings, different ways of getting people interested in taking in roles in their neighborhoods on the more uh, leadership level. So 
Um, there would be a lot of night meetings and weekends and those types of things. Um, this position would also take over administering as a neighborhood liaison to the new associations that are created because as we know when they come on board they don't have a lot of structure and they need some hand holding to get through uh, till they're a little bit more established so that pers this person or position would handle some of that. It would also handle some rollout of some new programs that uh, we're looking at with the TIF dollars that are coming in from the TIF extensions into the Affordable Housing Fund, um, some additional housing rehab programs to kind of help with uh, affordable people that maybe don't have, uh, uh, people lower to moderate income individuals that are making improvements in affordable housing and kind of fall within the gap of not having um, any equity to fall, to, to fall under the city's federal programs. Um, or they have other challenges, but they still need to make improvements to their property. So we are working on establishing um, some funding mechanisms to help with that, and this position would handle that as well. Um, we also see this as really being a kind of boots on the ground and providing technical assistance and working with uh, people on kind of city concerns and processes and programs and where to go and kind of being up on all of that stuff. So they're really kind of our liaison person out in the field to try to connect the gaps between some of the departments um, and some of the services that we provide. So that's kind of it in a nutshell. I've included a copy in your packet of the neighborhood engagement specialist job description. Um, this was really laid out based on recommendations and information received from other communities. Um, and Chief Demogowski and I and the mayor and Todd and Caitlin had met numerous times and kind of talked about this and we feel that this is the best plan for the city moving forward because we've seen to this date success in neighborhood associations but we've struggled to create neighborhood associations across the city at the basis that we need to. If we're gonna create one a year for 12 years, it's gonna take us 72 years to create neighborhood associations. You can't retire. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Administrator Wolf. Thank you, Chair. Um, Chad, thank you for that explanation, and I just wanted to kind of throw a few more things out there real quickly. This position is definitely something that I support as well as the others, because we really, we talk about strategic planning, we talk about uh, the growth and development of our constituents and our neighborhoods and how do we clean up our neighborhoods, how do we help our, our citizens to get the benefits, especially with, uh, in regards of affordable housing and just, uh, you know, homeowner um, repairs and things like that. This is a huge opportunity for us to really expand on what the, the chief has brought forward since 2010 in bridging the gap between communication with the city and with the, the actual neighborhoods. We don't have enough capacity and we don't have enough um, team members to actually get in there and actually help our constituents. So the more we can bridge the gap and allow them to have more interaction with the great things that the city can do and for us to be able to understand what they need is part of our you know, ongoing strategic plan moving forward. So um, thank you for bringing this forward. Other Perella? Yes, I, so I just wanted to say that um, I approve of the, I think it's a great idea. I, I have experienced firsthand how useful uh, neighborhood associations can be, especially, and not only, but especially because of the presence of the officers. Uh, during these uh, efforts, and um, I absolutely approve the uh, the idea. Thank you, uh, Alder Flakipaneski. Thank you. Um, I've I've heard with the police department several times. So, is the police department going to fund part of this position? No. The position would be funded through Community Development Block Grant and the Affordable Housing Fund. But they would work like we do today. All of our people in the Department of Planning and Development, the majority of them are funded with a portion of federal dollars, but work daily with the um, police department because they have boots on the ground. Okay. 
if I may, add, if I may um, add a few things and correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Chief, as we continue to grow the neighborhood associations upwards to 72, which is I think everybody's goal, part of the um, constraint is also the additional need in the future for um, additional services from the police department because your team are also attending these meetings and involved in these neighborhoods. So it's, it's kind of twofold. It, it helps them to communicate and participate with the neighbors and the neighborhoods to be more of more seen as a as an ally and as a, as support in cleaning up neighborhoods. But it also does mean, uh, since we're using the boots on the ground all the time, it does mean the need for additional boots and uh, staff to be able to be available at these times. Correct me if I'm wrong. I guess I would have two comments. One is that I, that I would hope at this point that we see this not as a police department program, but as a city program. And that's really the point that I've tried to make in the meetings that I've been involved in. If the city's not behind it, then fine, then let's, let's stop. We, we've put a lot of time and energy and resources into this and either the city's committed to building neighborhood organizations, strengthening community and community building, and really trying to engage the public in the governing uh, of the city. And if we're not, if we're, if we're interested in doing that, then we have to fund it and provide the resources to do it successfully. Because we're, we're at a point now that just to maintain the 12 that we have, we. We need more resources to, to do that from a planning standpoint, in my, my view. And if we want to grow it, same thing. We need the people there to, to provide the support and the engagement with the citizens if we really want them to participate and give of their time and become involved. And so that's really where, where I see us, where we're at. Father Faldi. Thank you, Chair. Um, I have questions about the funding um, because you know everybody, this is the finance and everybody comes to us about you know, their needs and I'm a little worried when, when it says um, the funding for the position shall come from the affordable housing fund and community development fund and then the following paragraph says um, provided for as part of the 22 budget prior to expanding such expending such funds. So first total, total amount the position would cost, class D doesn't tell anybody, you know, what, what that starting wage would be. And then second, um, I, I guess in order, I'm in favor of it 100%, but I have to worry about the funding and, you know, nothing should be coming out of capital improvements. Well, this isn't coming out of capital improvements. The plan for this under a salary grade D is to, um, I think it's 43 to 55,000 and then benefits is 25,000 or so, so right around 75,000. Um, the thought pattern is, is that it would be split in half um, 35,000, 37,000, whatever it takes to get to that would come from each funding mechanism, the affordable housing fund, which is set up to be there for providing improvements to the affordable housing in the community, and the block grant program, which we dedicate uh, it, as we continue to get roughly 950 to a million dollars a year from the feds and we can dedicate 20% of those funds to admin dollars, which is about 180,000 a year. So that funds a portion of my salary, it funds a portion of the grant coordinator. Um, actually four people in the planning and development department are funded with portions of that, but there is still some flexibility in there. Um, one of the things we, we reprogrammed a program assistant who is also now helping us administer this block grant program and make sure our, our files are all up to snuff. Um, that position was funded with partially CDBG, but as we're implementing this short-term rental under the tourism uh, fund, uh, this new software that we have, we there's gonna be some legwork that we're gonna have to do on our end just to keep up on it. So the idea is, is that 
um, you know, we estimate and, and the host compliance, the software people we're working with are saying that, you know, they're seeing a 33% increase in short-term rentals year over year in our community with almost double the rate for nightly stays. So of what they're seeing anywhere else in the US. So there's lost revenue there that will be coming into the tourism fund that we're gonna, we can reallocate some of the city, depart, city development staff time to tourism to manage that program with the finance department, which will alleviate some additional CDBG dollars to be funded towards this. But in running the numbers and the percentages that we allocate people's time, there, there's no problem with the, having the flexibility in that federal source to do this. Okay. So it would not come from capital, it would not come from the general fund, it would come strictly from these two special revenue funds. Thank you. Oh, there, Ackley. I'm good, she asked what I was gonna ask. Sounds good. Thank you. Oh, there, Flick, you've been asking. Thank you. Um, I am in favor of neighborhood associations. I have three out of 12 in my district and I know they're active, and I know they're worthwhile, and I know the policemen who regularly work the beats and come. So that's not a problem. What I hear is a problem, what I see as a problem, is this committee has been told we, we don't, it started with we don't have the revenues, and you just ask, you know, you just answered that fine. But adding something to the table of organization when we are getting a report about employment in the city, I, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't work well for me. So, and it, it feels like rushed if we, had, if we had the report, if we had the, the complete structure. Um, and, and no secret, I am in favor of adding one position just for communications for, for a business this size. We have no centralized communications. So that's, that's my push-pull with this particular position. It's not the position itself, and it's definitely not neighborhood associations. So how do we work that through? As I've stated in the past, it's very difficult to use federal resources to benefit low to moderate income people to be able to do community-wide communications. So this program can do neighborhood communications and can help, this person can help link some of those and hopefully, hopefully you know, deal with any kind of interdepartmental issues that residents might have with departments or getting them to the right people like we do today with our neighborhood associations and all the people involved with it. But to think that this position under these two funding mechanisms can fund a community-wide communications person is a totally it's different a pot of money. Even on the affordable housing side, I mean, it, it would be very difficult for that. So the only way that could happen is if the general fund can come up with money to fund whatever portion of that is gonna be communication related. And then it gets into the question of who manages this person? And does this person report half time to me and half time to the mayor? Or how does that all happen? So I think it's just, you know, this is really about building relationships in neighborhoods to facilitate the neighborhood association program, get neighborhood associations developed, and being able to provide the resources to the ones that are developing. And that's pretty, and then doing some housing rehab stuff in between, which they'll just do naturally because people will then be talking to them about their needs and they'll have familiarity to, with the program and they'll be kind of like our marketer out in the community of touch, touching base with the resources that the city does provide or that other nonprofits provide. So there'll be some indirect communication, but I don't see a, a way of being able to make this position be a citywide communications person. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Administrator Wolf. I'm good unless there's additional questions. I was going to just basically clarify what uh, Chad had basically brought up is these are two different subjects. Um, I, we don't wanna bring forward anything at this time because of the 
uh, Carlson Detman study, but this is a separate entity because it is being funded from um, other other funds than the general fund and operations. Correct. So thank you for that clarity. Any other discussion on this one? Uh, if not, we'll be looking for a motion to approve. Where one, two, so choose to make such a motion. Motion to approve. I move to approve. All right. We have a motion. Do we have a second? The chair cannot second, correct? The chair can. Okay, well then I will second the motion, seeing no other. Uh, and then last call for discussion. We now have a motion and a second in front of us. Uh, seeing none, all those in favor, please indicate by saying aye. Aye. All opposed? Aye. Abstentions? Was that three opposed? Okay, uh, chair votes aye. The motion then does not pass two, three. Uh, moving on to item number seven then is resolution number 170 of 2122. A resolution authorizing the appropriate city officials to enter into a master continuing disclosure services agreement that provides for Ellers to be retained as the city's dissemination agent for issuer continuing disclosure as required pursuant to Securities and Exchange Commission Rule 15C2-12. Thank you. Uh, this item is just allowing us to enter into a contract with Ehlers, our financial advisor, in order for them to assist the finance department with continuing disclosures. Uh, we, uh, this is another branch of their services. They all already do um, the bond issuance with us in the financial advising, so this is just another branch of what they offer, but keeps us, un keeps us in compliance and on track with that piece. Questions, comments, Elder Flicky Paneske? the provider prior to this? Uh, Carol Wirth at uh, Wisconsin Public Finance. Thank you. Yes. Alder Brella. Thank you. Uh, just to clarify, the, so the fee schedule says that, it, do I understand it correctly that in our case, due to the number of securities of notes that we will need to disseminate, um, information on. The fee schedule for us would be only $3,800. $3, per year, correct. Per year, correct, perfect. So that will be the cost. And I will have another question afterwards when we address the following item actually related to this. Um, that's it, that's it for now, thank you. Any other discussion on this one? If not, we'll be looking for a motion to approve. So moved. Second. All right, we have a motion and a second, then seeing no further discussion, all in favor? Aye. aye. All opposed? Chair votes aye, the ayes have it, and the motion passes. On to item number eight, which is resolution number 171 of 2122 a resolution authorizing the appropriate city officials to execute an engagement letter with Quarles and Brady LLP to serve as disclosure counsel with regard to general obligation promissory notes. Hello again. Uh, this is for Quarles and Brady. They did provide us with disclosure counsel for this latest issue um, of debt. This is also hoping to move forward. We can uh, engage in disclosure counsel. It allows us to be compliant in the actual document that we produce that goes out to the investors. So it makes sure that we have everything um, related to our previous debt, demographic information, market information. A lot of information goes into this uh, offering document that goes out to everybody and they are uh, helping us make sure that the city is staying compliant and not missing anything in those documents. Uh, Elder Flicky Paneski. 
This, this is distinct from Ehlers. Ehlers starts the process and they finish the process. Yeah, that would be pretty accurate. Ehlers helps us begin to compile the information, but they're just taking what we take, what we give them and compiling it. The Disclosure Council actually will go through all the information and make sure that from what they have on their records, they'll look at news articles to see if there's businesses that are closing locally, things like that, just to see if we need to disclose anything in those statements that Ehlers would not have um, caught or what we did not provide. So who actually writes the prospectus? Does Quarles and Brady or does Ehlers? I would say Ehlers begins it and then Quarles and Brady provides edits to it. Thank you. Yeah, so Quarles acts as disclosure counsel. So they're actually doing the legal work around this. Uh, Ehlers is more, what they're doing is filing documents. They're assisting with the creation of those documents, but the primary role is there is, is to file them. Quarles and Brady will basically do the legal work around making sure that all of our disclosures are what is required by the Securities and Exchange Commission. Thank you. Other Perella? Yeah, my question was the same actually. So basically, one prepares the content, most of the content, the other one disseminates it. Yeah. Kind of. Correct. All right, so perfect. Thank you for that confirmation. And in this case, the cost to us is $7,800. Correct, and that is built into the bond issuance. So that is part of the cost that is already included in the bond. Perfect, thank you. Any other discussion on this one? Uh, seeing none then, we'll be looking for a motion to approve. So moved. Second. All right, we have a motion and a second then. Uh, seeing no further discussion, all in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Chair votes aye, the ayes have it, and the motion passes. On to item number nine, which is the annual report for the uh, municipal court. Nice to be here. So my report is pretty straightforward. I basically just have figures um, showing our citation numbers um, back for the past five years and then also our revenue collections. This year we added a line for restitution um, paid to victims because that's an important function of, of what we do at, at the municipal court is able to make people whole, at least in part, um, and, and reimburse them for, for damages that they might have incurred. So you can see in looking at the report that we've had a substantial impact in our number of citations and that due to COVID. So in 2019, our total citations um, had already uh, been a little bit down from the year prior, but they were at 65.95. And during my time, that seems to be a normal range uh, for citation numbers each year between 6,500 and 7,000. Um, but went from 65.95 in 2019 to 5,027 uh, for 2020. And that was um, due to just a decreased um, number of, of citations being written um, across the board um, in both from the uh, building inspection department um, as well as um, substantially from the police department. What is interesting, if you take a look, you can see that the Kohler Police Department actually wrote almost 33% more citations between 2019 and 2020. And that was due to some staffing changes that they had. Um, so, the, and, and decisions that they made to actually increase. And you can see that they've continued to increase. Um, I'm seeing that kind of leveling off. I don't expect uh, Kohler to end up at more than a, a thousand or so citations a year, but um, we'll see. So they, in effect, tripled their citation numbers over three years. Um, in terms of, Revenues um, for 2020, they they um, almost exactly corresponded so to the drop in citations. So citations went down 23.77 percent. Citation, excuse me, revenues went down 23.39 percent um, compared to 2019. And then for our citation numbers uh, for 2021 compared to 2019, they were down about 12 percent. So I'm starting to see that um, pick up. Uh, so, so we'll see how how things work out. So this this shows how many citations were written. It doesn't show dismissals. It, it doesn't show um, 
how many cases went to trial. It just shows it, the initial number that came into our court. Because of Roads to Recovery dollars, we were able to um, start implementing virtual court in uh, January of 2021, and we still do that. And, and so that's made our court a lot more accessible to um, the public, and I'll continue to do that. I've, uh, made a decision to start to go back to primarily in-person court um, starting in June, but people will have the option to appear virtually if they want to, so that, that won't change um, as we try to get back um, to, to having more appearances. But because of the, the reduction in um, citations um, and not seeing the, the public as much um, during normal um, court business, um, we tried to reach out and do more engagement. And so starting um, last year, we began um, offering free weddings at the court. I was able to continue doing the things that I've done in the past, working with, with the chamber and their leadership program, having mock trial um, engagement activities. Um, I uh, was able to get an intern again this year from Lakeland College. So starting to, to do some of those things again. Um, I believe most of you are aware that we did have uh, staffing uh, problems last year um, at the court, which were unprecedented, but that had no impact on the court's um, function in terms of having hearings. So there, were, so there wasn't one court date um, that was missed uh, because of the, the staffing uh, issues. So I'm not sure if you have any, any questions or um, any feedback on this information. Questions or comments? Father Perella. First of all, thank you so much uh, for um, um, for the report. Uh, I was just curious, how many weddings did you celebrate during 2021? I only um, had two in at the court. Most people want to go outside of the court, even though we have a nice building. <laughs> so I get I get calls um, to to go you know outside, which I've always done. Um, and that was that was still fun. I did some weddings. Um, they were outside because of COVID. So I did some weddings by Lake Michigan, by North Point. I did a wedding by the Baseball Diamond at um, Evergreen. Or is it Evergreen or Maywood? I don't know. Maywood, maybe. maybe. Um, I, you know, I've gone to people's homes, but I only had two people who who wanted to do it at the at the court. And I think that's because right now I'm just doing them when I would be there on Wednesdays. I haven't decided to add, um, you know, a, a special day for that. And I just wanted to add that um, I personally would um, appreciate if we could have a, um, you know, learn about the importance of the municipal court. Sure. Just the same as you do to educate the public. I, I read that you do that sometimes. So yes. you do that on a regular basis. So I think that we as the Common Council also would um, benefit from it. At least I would. I don't know about my colleagues. So if you want to look into that, it's a possibility to educate us too, that would be good. Okay, and I've done that before, but that was years ago. So I can, I'll um, make arrangements to do that at a council meeting. Then. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. Uh -huh. Elder Flecky-Panaski. Thank you. Thank you for your report. Um, you, you add, I see the report here, and we see the statistics, but you added a lot more. You added uh, the weddings, the intern, the staffing, um, and uh, the dis number of dismissals. So the next time I would encourage you to put that in the writing in the report also, because that gets to be functional year after year after year. Because if you're if you're if you're doing this stuff, put it in the report. Okay, thank you. Any other discussion on this one? Uh, if not, thank you. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Will we be looking for a motion, I believe, to recommend the council accepts and files the document? So moved. Second. All right, we have a motion and a second. Then seeing no further discussion, all in favor? Aye. aye. All opposed? Chair votes aye. The ayes have it. The motion passes. 
Next up is item number 10, which is a motion to convene and close session under the exemption provided in section 19.851G, uh, Wisconsin statutes for the purpose of conferring with legal counsel for the government body who is rendering oral or written advice concerning strategy to be adopted by the body with respect to litigation in which it is involved. To which, Boygan County case number 2020CV000253, Audrey Brubreaker et al. versus City of Sheboygan et al. And we will be coming back into open session to adjourn the meeting. But now we are looking for a motion to go into closed session. So moved. Second. All right, we have a motion and a second. I believe this one is a roll call vote. So, Alder Ackley? Aye. Alder Feldy? Aye. Alder Flicky Paneski? Aye. Alder Perala? Aye. Alder Mitchell, chair votes aye. Uh, we will be moving into closed session. We'll give it a few minutes for recess for us to get moved over to the conference room. Chuck, I have a one more parliamentary inquiry for you. Uh, under the open session section, item number 11 is the motion to reconvene. Are we So you made that motion to reconvene while you were in closed session because you kind of have to do it in closed session in order to get into open session. So you've passed that, and now we're on number 12. Perfect. Thank you. In that case, uh, as our city attorney said, we are on to item number 12, which is direct referral of resolution number 172 of 2122, a resolution authorizing the city attorney's office to settle the matter of Audrey Brubreaker et al. versus city of Sheboygan et al. Sheboygan County case number 2020CV000253. Do we have a motion on this item? Second. Was that a motion to approve? All right, well, in that case, we have a motion and a second. Seeing no discussion, all in favor? Aye. All opposed? Chair votes aye. The ayes have it, and the motion passes. Our next meeting will be on April 11th, which reminds me, I do have to apologize to everybody that we did not get to have that fun extra meeting in between this one and the last that we talked about. I promise you I'll make it up to you sometime. It's okay. Uh, and we are on to the last item, which is a motion to adjourn. Do we have such a motion? So moved. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Seeing no discussion on adjournment. All in favor? Aye. All opposed? Chair votes aye, the ayes have it, and the motion passes. We are adjourned. Thank, Thank you, everybody. You.